Mass transportation is a part of the way that people connect their lives through the city. They live the way they live in New York City because of their proximity to mass transit. When we see people protesting the cost of the fare, this isn't anything new. This is about the right of mobility, and restrictions should not be a thing in terms of people being able to navigate different parts of the city. I'm Stephanie Johnson Cunningham, and we are discussing transportation today on display. To understand mass transportation is to understand that it is a core part of our everyday experience and everyday life here in New York City. It's almost like the heartbeat of the city. So to know that there is a segment of our society that don't have access to it is to understand that there is a segment that is being crippled because they don't have the financial means to take public transportation. New York's transportation history happened in phases, from early ships and passenger ferries to more modern subways, trains, buses, and cars. The New York Transit Museum's collection, artistic renderings, historic maps, guidebooks, and digital technology highlights how the city's transportation has catalyzed its development. So this station that we're in right now, it was built in 1936. It was called Court Street Station. In 1946, the station shut down. And then in 1976, or late 1975, uh, there was a, a core of transit workers who decided that they wanted to put on an exhibition, a temporary pop-up exhibition with a lot of the vintage trains. Today, we are still here, 43 years later. It never shut down. It was so popular that we have been able to remain as a museum to this day. One of our main focuses in education is really helping people understand that they live the way they live in New York City because of their proximity to mass transit and they just might not know it. And so we try to help people understand how neighborhoods have uh, been built because of where the train lines are going, who has access to mass transit and how that impacts their lives. New York's growth can be found throughout the increasingly connected transportation system. Mass transit helped make the greater New York region what it is today. So um, one story I like to talk about um, is the story of Elizabeth Jennings Graham. So we all know about Rosa Parks, but what most people don't know is that there was a 24-year-old school teacher, a black woman named Elizabeth Jennings Graham, who um, won a landmark legal case 100 years before Rosa Parks. So Elizabeth, on a hot summer day in 1854, um, was getting on a school car with her friend heading to church, and so she was asked by the, the horse car operator to get off of the car because of her race. When she refused, she was forced off physically by a policeman and thrown to the ground. And so a year later, she actually sued the, the, the horse car company. She won that landmark case. It's an important story to tell because even though it was an um, impactful victory for her, it didn't end segregation on public transportation. That happened legally in 1873. So her like having the, uh, the audacity to sue a privately owned company in that day was, was a huge deal. Yeah. yeah, and so we have an individual story, mm -hmm. but then there's also a story of a specific event that happened too, the bus boycott. Can you share yeah. a bit about that as well? Yeah. In 1941, black workers went on strike in Harlem to kind of have the transport union workers, TWUs, um, have them live up to their kind of principle to have a diverse workplace. And so it was a peaceful protest. A key figure in that protest was Adam Clayton Powell Jr., who was a pa the minister at the Abyssinian Baptist Church at that time. And so what resulted was um, 100 black workers becoming, you know, bus mechanics and operators because they were hired as cleaners and things like that. Even if they had the required skills to be promoted, they were not. Yeah, and Adam mm -hmm. Clayton Powell was mm -hmm. like our Martin Luther King yes, here in yes. New York City. Like yes, really yeah. because a lot of people mm -hmm. know about 
bus boycotts throughout the mm -hmm. country, but not really know mm -hmm. about the history of the Harlem bus boycott right. and how significant that was as well. And it was, you know, something that King kind of looked to to kind of protest Rosa Parks arrest. Um, when he does bus sit-ins, yeah. he looked to the Harlem bus boycott and the, the, and how it was peaceful and so got things done. Those two stories stand out to me the most, um, being a Harlem native. Yeah. It was really interesting to learn about this boycott and I definitely didn't know about Elizabeth. Yeah. So being here really helped me learn that yeah. story. Yeah, and I'm grateful yeah. that the institution has mm -hmm. these kind of stories Absolutely. on display as well. Yeah. yeah. The museum also shows the evolution of fare collection across all of New York's modes of transportation, such as turnstiles and fare boxes, to get a sense of the colossal process of fare collection. Even though here in New York we think like every year we're getting a, a fair increase, um, actually the the largest fair increase happened at the start of the Second World War oh, wow. when the fair doubled from five cents to just ten cents, and so that caused an outrage. Of so course. imagine, <laughs> and so so having this in our collection, we kind of see see where it was and where we're headed. This is a really extensive collection we have here in the museum. It starts from from 1928, um, when the, the IRT last had th their tokens, and it goes all the way through to the mid-90s. And yeah, it was, it was really cool to see this mm -hmm. um, evolution through the years, and also like the slugs that were used to avoid payments. Yeah. Um, I think these worked, some of them might have not. Mm -hmm. Like, I believe they went in and so at, as are, they were. What are they? Yeah, so they were just like different things, some that kind of look like tokens, yeah. but they're slightly off in a certain way. Oh, wow. We see from probably DC Metro mm -hmm. <laughs> and other currency from other countries. Wow. People are using what they call slugs to enter into the system, right? So creating their own coins. And that is a form of protest. And so when we see people protesting the cost of the fear, when we see people protesting that black and brown people are targeted in the subway system, this isn't anything new. And the Transit Museum allows us to see that history firsthand. The question that stands out to me is, why are we charging so much for transportation? And why isn't the city investing more into our system, our transportation system? The Swipe It Forward movement offers a swipe to your fellow New Yorkers. If you have an unlimited Metro card, it will cost you nothing to swipe someone in as you exit the station across the city. So Swipe It Forward is really based on the concept of paying it forward. And it's really telling New Yorkers that if you have an unlimited Metro card, when you exit the station and you see someone leering, like kind of looming near the turnstile, you can offer them a swipe. But we also, through grassroots um, fundraising, have put money on Metro cards and chant and let people know in community that if you need a swipe, we got you. Yeah. Prioritizing um, black and brown New Yorkers, recognizing that they are disproportionately impacted through ticketing and arrest. The issue that we see within the transportation system with people being arrested for fear evasion is a part of what's known as broken window policies, where here in New York City, people are arrested and ticketed for small infractions in hopes that people won't commit larger crimes. It's interesting because when we do those actions, oftentimes the people in the booth will call the police on us. Um, and I've been harassed by the police when I have done that action. Yeah, and it's a completely legal action. Yeah, it's really cool sometimes when you're able to support community yeah. within yeah. the parameters. Working within the parameters of the law. The, that, to dismantle the system. That loophole, It's yeah. like, ooh, and I know they're probably like, oh man, these right. activists, and we're like, we're clever. Yes. And we're thinking about it. And I think this is about the right of mobility mm -hmm. um, and, and restrictions should not be a thing in terms of people being able to navigate different parts of the city. I've seen people get arrested for jumping the turnstile. I've seen police officers enter the bus in my neighborhood and pull people off, off the bus to arrest them or to give them a ticket for being on the bus without any form of um, Metro card or any tickets. 
So the Center for Anti-Violence Education um, originally started in 1974, and it started as a place in the 70s that was um, that taught women uh, martial arts, self-defense. So that was its original roots, and then it transitioned into being um, a nonprofit, which now we have um, a plethora of different programs, and we still have our self-defense and martial arts program as well. But now it's ext extended to um, including our active bystander intervention. We teach. Um, across the city, so about 3,000 New Yorkers a year, from schools to community-based organizations. That's really amazing, and I can see how the, how effective that can be for a lot of people. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the best thing is people to know their rights um, and to know that they have the right to speak up for themselves. They have the right to advocate for themselves if the police has stopped them. So knowing your rights is also nuanced because we know that we live in a world where you can know your rights, do all the things, and you can still be murdered. So this action is a direct way to say we are here for our community. This is an action that is legal and it is an action that is directly community based. No one should go to jail, be arrested, ticketed for 275. That is ridiculous. And the fines for it is $100. So if someone is not able to pay 275, how would they be able to pay two, you know, a $100 fine? Right. That idea of criminalizing poverty um, and the swipe of forward action being a direct action to combat that, that is saying you should not be penalized for not having this money. Because in addition, um, to further penalize crop, um, poverty, there is um, aggressive panhandling. So if you are by the station, um, by the turnstile, asking someone for a swipe, they can look at that and say that that's aggressive panhandling, and you can get a ticket for that as well. So people have to literally stand by, hope that someone will offer them a swipe, or do a really like low-key, like kind of, you know, signaling, because if the police catch you essentially asking for a swipe, you can also get penalized for that. In New York City, we really have to fight for those who may not have access in the way that we all have access, whether because they are working poor or they are homeless. And so instead of harm people who cannot access the trains, we need to help them. Being a part of an organization that helps to create a better world, the world that I want to live in, I owe it to the people who are coming after me, the younger folks, to feel to feel safer in the world. And then I also owe it to my ancestors and to people who have fought for, for me to do this work. And that is healing for me as a survivor of violence. Um, it's healing for me as a person who is a part of the black um, queer community. And so I'm able to help heal myself as well um, and help others heal. Museums are civic spaces. They are in charge of providing us with knowledge, with what's happening right before us, what's happening right around us that's affecting so many of us. So you may not necessarily be a person who can't afford to take the trains, but it's important to get involved and to know what your neighbors in New York City are facing and dealing with. And museums and other historic sites and cultural institutions are a large part of getting that narrative out to the public.